I was already introduced, so um, I'm 31 now, and I've been programming since I was 15 to 16. And I've already programmed in assembly, C, Java, uh, Pro, Lisp, Haskell. And uh, I've been currently using mostly Python and Golang. Um, I'm Brazilian, and I'm in London for around one year and a half now. And uh, most of my job is developed in Python. Uh, I work for this company, EF. Who heard of EF? Does anyone know about it? Good. Because one year and a half ago, when I was headhunted, I had never heard about them either. Uh, but it's a quite impressive company. So there are around 40,000 employees around the world. And uh, the purpose of the company is to provide education. And their main business is related to language teaching. So they have interchange where students from one country can go to a native speaking country and learn more about that language in place. And they also have business schools um, and they have local English schools. So they're called international language um, learning schools and they are around all the world. So there are over 500 offices and schools, uh, including in Slovakia. So I did my research. And another curious fact is that it's a privately held by the, com by the guy who founded the company. So there is no outside investment nor anything. So that's quite nice. Um, inside EF, I work developing applications to help teaching and learning English. So I work for this department, Classroom Technology Experience. And, and there we develop both web and mobile apps. Um, and also a pla authoring platform where publishers can write English courses and lessons and so on. This is part of our team in a travel we did last year to Malta. Um, and this is the other backend guy. So although we have users around the world, right now we are only two backend engineers. And despite taking care of all the backend and all the DevOps of the things, we sometimes try to, to go to other fields, such as cooking. Um, so this presentation wouldn't be possible without Rafael's work and support. Um, I have a few objectives here, and I don't know about you guys, so you can make questions and just lead to where you would like. But I would like to show to you guys first a challenge, a challenge that we have, many companies have. Um, then I would like to show a useful data, data set. So we just had an awesome talk about scientific Python programming. And sometimes people lack data sets that they could use to train classifiers and experiment. And I will uh, show to you guys a data set that's openly available. Anyone can download and test it out. Um, I will show a bunch of Python scripts. They are quite ugly, because they didn't take the time to cleaning them up, but they work. And I would then like to have some ideas from whatever ideas you guys would ha have to try to contribute to this work. And ho we are planning to have this as an open source tool that could help anyone. So the ugly scripts we developed are already available online on GitHub so anyone can play around with them. So what is the challenge? Who here is a teacher? So we have a few. Um, uh, my parents are both teachers. And one of the hugest pains of my father was always when he had to evaluate exercises from students. So he had to go through, he's a physician, so he would have to check all the time, again and again, the same answers and check what is wrong, what is right, and so on. And in English, teaching is not different. So normally, whenever you give an assessment, whenever you give uh, an essay, you ask your students to write an essay, it can be quite boring and not very pleasant to have to go through hundreds and hundreds of essays and writing activities and try to correct them with basic mistakes. Um, so this is an example of an essay. 
I shouldn't send in our uh, school. It's anonymized. That's not her real name. But you guys can have an idea of how is to be an English teacher. So, hi, my name is Crystal. Um, nine years old. Um, from China. Um, live in Yangshi, Shangyu. There are two people in my family, my mother, my father. My mother is 36 years old, my father is 37 years old. So uh, there, there are a few basic mistakes there. So a teacher who went through this would probably spot, oh my God, this person doesn't use capital letters. So in the beginning of the sentence, we would expect to use capital letters. And then as a name of someone, Crystal should be also in capital letters. After the dot, we would expect also capital letters. Um, then spelling, this is not how we write I am. It's a contraction, so we should write it in a little different way. Uh, form is not form, although this is a valid English word. What she expected to say there was from. And, so, and this is town, is would be town, like city. And, and then, of course, this I'm leave, it's not a proper verb tense setup. So I leave, only that would, be wor that would work. So you can see, just on this very tiny sample, we have around 17 mistakes. And these mistakes, imagine you, during years and years of all, all your life, going through this, the same mistakes, the same problems, and I it can be very frustrating. Uh, so, this is a problem we would like to overcome. So, the idea wa would be, let's try to build algorithms and tools which can help teachers assessing English-written essays. Um, and this doesn't have to be only for teachers. So, supposing our tool is really cool, and you would like to make sure when you code using VI, for instance, you would like to have a plugin that would check if all the code you're writing is being written in proper English. So you could build a plugin which would use these algorithms and you wouldn't, would have a beautifully uh, English written code. Uh, an example of commercial applications who use this kind of things, we have uh, LibreOffice, we have Google Apps when you're writing emails or Google Docs. Um, and Word, of course. So many people see when you're typing things, uh, they ha underline uh, saying, hey, this seems a mistake. Um, so the idea would just be to write something open source that could help highlighting potential mistakes a user is, is making while writing English. So from a programming perspective, the input would be an English text and the output would be a list saying these are the positions where we have mistakes, these are the words. What kind of mistake is that? Is it a spelling, is it a capitalization, some article, some pronoun? And, and then, if possible, the proposal fix. H look, you wrote this, but the correct form would be this other one. Um, so, this is our challenge, and we didn't uh, achieve all of it, but in very few hours of programming, we got some very interesting results, and I will be sharing with you guys what we achieved this far. Uh, so, before we start, a little about the data set. So, to do this work, we had almost a half million student essays, um, and there are over two million sentences, word tokens. They were from uh, 85,000 learners, students from 16 levels of proficiency, from beginners to advanced students. And uh, all of these writings, they had been annotated manually by English teachers. So they used this tool just to say, okay, no, this is not, this is wrong, 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 wrong. And they could propose what would be the fix for that. Uh, and this is quite awesome. So all this information uh, was retrieved 
from EF Systems, so one of the products of the company is called English Town, and it's an English online school. And um, we managed to have the company allowing to export this data and share with the world. Um, this kind of information is very, very valuable because it's quite expensive to have people who have a good knowledge in a domain to annotate things manually. Uh, of course, many of the annotations of the teachers are not perfect, and there are many mistakes the students made the teachers didn't find. But it's still, it's, it's good as a base, and it helps us when we are developing automated tools to try to do this automation to compare how well our tool is performing uh, compared to a human being. Um, some examples of topics of the essays we had related to writings. So introducing yourself by email or writing a movie review, writing an apology email. There are all sorts of kinds, kinds of writings depending on the level of the students. Uh, there are over 150, I think there are 150 nationalities. And the ones we have the most are this. Uh, most are Brazilians, then Chinese, Russians, Mexicans, Germans, and lots and lots of other nationalities. Um, this database was developed as a partnership between Cambridge University and EF. So EF gave the data and it sponsored a research unit in Cambridge. And with this work, they were able to extract lots of data from EF's databases and try to make something that would make sense from a researcher's perspective, only with the information that really makes sense. Um, so some kinds of mistakes that were annotated by the teachers. Um, agreement, um, article, so if you use an article such as a, a house, but you say a houses in plural, it should be only used with a singular word afterwards. So that's a mistake. Uh, combined sentence capitalization, if something should be capital and it's lowercase, or the opposite. If some words shouldn't be there, just delete it, or um, all sorts of errors. Plural, preposition, punctuation. Uh, and the interesting thing from the data we have is that uh, each of these lines is one of these kinds of mistakes. So if you check the PU, which stands for punctuation, is one of the most common mistakes students make. Uh, and teachers are notated. This could be wrong, but we expect that at least in average, it is similar to the reality. Then in the second place would stand to capitalization, this line here. And then spelling, this line here. And, and this uh, diagram illustrates uh, how many mistakes of this type each level of a student would make. So beginners make more mistakes, usually. Whereas um, advanced learners of a language make less mistakes, um, and they are more mixed. Um, for the purpose of what we did this far, we worked with capitalization, spelling, and article. So we thought those would be the easiest problems to, to, t to try to solve, and two of them were top three. So we thought it could be quite useful to use that approach. If anyone in this room would like to have access to this data, it's possible to do it by this URL. So these slides are shared publicly, you can find in the conference website soon. So you will be able to access this. You just need to register and you can have access to the data and download to your own computer. Um, the license, it's use non-commercial research. And if you guys would like to use for commercial purposes, uh, you can negotiate. So you can find information in this file. Uh, when you log into the website, you would expect to see something like this. So here are the amount of uh, essays per level of a student, so beginner, advanced. Uh, here you can filter, so if you would be interested only in P1, 
people from Europe who are in the level five. So they're kind of intermediate students. You could filter out and try to figure out what are the most common problems or try to reproduce or do some classification, etc. cetera. Uh, once you've registered, you can filter the data set and it's possible to export to XML. Um, and it will look something like this. So uh, there was an issue in this website. Uh, it's hosted by the Cambridge folks, and we couldn't solve it in time. So the XML right now, it's not valid, but we made a script to fix it. So you guys can go through all these steps at home, and all that I show here, hopefully, you will manage to reproduce. So the bunch of Python scripts that we developed. Uh, just a disclaimer. Who here knows about the Agile methodology? Okay, so the Agile methodology is something that uh, claims we should uh, try to do things uh, well, and people are important, the communication is important, we should try to have quality in our code, code review, and lots of important values. To do this Python script, we did quite the opposite. So we used a methodology called Go Horse Process, and and it's just a joke. So if you check the principles of the go horse thing, uh, those are all the things you should not do at home. Uh, but it's still, uh, it was a proof of concept. And as we really wanted to show you guys how it's possible to develop something fast to solve real problems, uh, that was the way we did. But we plan um, after this conference to clean up the code and, and make it uh, proper. By proper, we understand to have a high coverage of automated tests, such as 90% of coverage or more, uh, to have a good structure, uh, and to have proper documentation, including doc strings and something that could be helpful. Uh, so what do these scripts do? We have a bash script to fix the XML files, um, and all the other things were implemented using Python. So we convert the XM fi XML files into JSON files because we normally prefer to de deal with JSON. It's easier, it's nicer, they look nicer. Um, we implemented a few heuristics to identify some common English mistakes. They were, as I already said, spelling, capitalization, and articles. And we analyzed how efficient our algorithms were. So how close to the teacher's annotations we were. Um, you can find all this code in this repo. So it's available in GitHub. You can find there. Uh, there are the minimal steps you would require to reproduce these things. Um, so I would just like to show to you guys some hands-on. Um, so the, the normal flow we would do would be to process the XML file, um, and then we use this Python script, writer predict, and we give the original data set, and we say, please, output your predictions here. So let's have a look on how these files look like. Yes, I know they're not very nice, but uh, what we can do is to copy this. And then we can use uh, this. Oh. And we can do... So this is a nice looking JSON example. So you have um, changes, which were changes ba made by the teacher with the symbol of the mistake, the selection of the words that was mistaken, how would be the correct form, and where, which is the first character um, that, it, that word starts on. Um, and then you have punctuation and all those mistakes. You have the nationality of who wrote the essay, which level the person was, and the writing itself. 
So you can see it's just a normal, normal Python string. Um, so if we copy it, this is string here. Um, you can see that is simply a totally Python string. Um, so, what our script does when we run this command? Uh, it goes, we say to our algorithm, please predict. We say where is this initial data file, where we had the teacher's information, but we don't look to the teacher's information. We just get the text. And from this text, we try to create annotations using hypotheses and heuristics that I will show to you guys. Based on this, we output to another file which has the same shape as the previous one. What are our predictions? So uh, here I'm running this. It takes a few seconds and it will soon output in this file some predictions for this data set. So what it's doing is it gets the text field, processes, and hopefully it would propose all the same mistakes as the teachers got. Uh, but in practice, not that good. So then we use this other command line oh. here. Try to make it large. So we say to analyze. And we get the file, the original file that had been annotated by the teachers. We get the file where our software made predictions of the annotations. And we specify a mistake type, such as spelling. And based on this, we want to see how our implementation compares to the teachers. And we run this. And then, ta-da. Um, from this, you can see the format is not optimal, but you guys can have a view, uh, an understanding. So this would be the ID of that writing that the, the student wrote. This is what the teacher had written as a mistake in this position, and this is what our algorithm proposed. Um, and then uh, you can see these two other numbers here. One of them is the precision and the other is the recall. So from this screen, if you guys could read what is there, you would say, oh my god, this is really bad. Because what you have there is zero and zero. So we got zero precision and zero recall, which is really awful. But the thing is, we sorted in an inverted way. So the good results are just in the, in the beginning of this huge chunk. So let me export this a file and then we will open this wonderful file and then you guys can see eventually uh, that uh, here there are a few successful situations so this one from this text the teacher had uh, written that vist was misspelled and internet and we found vist um, and then here, morning, we found morning, it was supposed to be morning, 40, and, and lots of them. And when our algorithm does the things right, we have here the same information as here. And this would give us one of precision and one of recall, which is the maximum. Uh, so, in average, we got um, here, here. So the average precision we got for spelling was 61%. This means that um, out of the things, uh, comparing to the, a real teacher, a real human being, the script we took around three hours to implement allowed us, would allow us to highlight in a software such as Word or anything, 60% of the mistakes I shouldn't might have done while writing English. Um, so, uh, 
the things we did to check efficiency. We also wrote a few um, unit tests, so we would get a few basic cases that we wanted to cover and see if things were behaving as expected. And each interaction, if we said, okay, the first word in a phrase should start with capital letter. So we had this hypothesis. Let's try to build a regex, taking this into account. And then we would implement this into our function, and we would run again the data set. And this would allow us to see how much the precision increased or not, based on the changes we would make. Um, and we would, of course, use that comparison side by side to see what our script is doing wrong compared to the, a real teacher. Um, just as uh, to, to see if everyone knows the concept. So here uh, is the definition of precision and recall. So these are the two me uh, metrics we're using. So precision would be among the things we we said were wrong. How many of them were really wrong? So this is what we got around 61% first spelling. The other one would be uh, among the items that we selected, what percentage of how, what percentage of all the items that should have been selected we chose. So you can see these two concepts in these things. And these images are from Wikipedia, and they have a quite good explanation on this topic. And as it may be tricky to sort by having these two metrics, precision and recall, it's very common to use the F-score, which gives us uh, a, a number that involves these two concepts in a single one. So we can list and sort things to try to see how good or how bad we performed. In order to implement the spelling checker, what we did was we got the text, we removed all the Unicode symbols, then we transformed uh, letters that had accents to something that didn't. We removed all sorts of punctuation because for spelling, these things should not matter. And then we got a dictionary do you guys know right now if you wanted to have a, a list of valid English words, do you guys know how you could get this, despite going to a dictionary or a website? Does anyone have some clue? So I found this very cool thing. In Linux, you can find uh, lots of English words in some files, so both in Debian, Fedora, or whatever Linux distribution you guys use, you can, uh, probably it's already installed, and there is this file, you can just go there, and they have around 200 words, English words, which are valid. And we just use that. So we, we checked for each of the words in the text. Were they inside this valid English list of words? If they were, then it's fine. Probably they were not a spelling mistake. The other thing, does this thing have numbers? Because initially our algorithm would get, sometimes people are talking about numbers, prices, measurements, and then our script would keep complaining. This is a spelling mistake. 6M doesn't exist in a list of valid English words. And we don't expect it to exist. It's, it represents six meters. So what we did in this case is we would check if the word has any kind of numbers. And in this kind of situation, we considered, OK, it should not be a spelling mistake. And uh, we created a file with a few country names and uh, names of people that we saw that were quite common. So to create this file, we got around 10% of all the things we had, and we extracted part of this. So we wouldn't be getting to, if we had used all our files and captured all these words that have capital, it wouldn't be fair, because we would be just using our script, 
using the data, it would have a very huge precision for this data, but if we try to use it in anything else, there would be mistakes. So we got just a small percentage to extract a few words that we knew, such as China, uh, UK, Slovakia, all these words, uh, they, they are valid words. And if any of these things that would check if a word is valid succeeded, then we would say this word was misspelled. Uh, out of 85,000 essays that had mistakes, we got a mean precision of 71% and a mean recall of 65%. Um, and, and this is how it would change across different levels of English. Um, and this is out of curiosity, how many spelling uh, mistakes we found based on nationality. So the first one was Russia, and then China, and, and you can check later. But this is only based on the data we have. Uh, Capitalization-wise, the strategies we used. First, we had to define what are sentences. F to do this, we split using punctuation. Um, then, we would check if a word is expected to be in capital in English. So, um, is it a uh, first person? I. I should always be capital. Day of the week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, should always be capital. Month should always be kept in English. Is it a language? Uh, so we build lists with this information. Whenever possible, we would get from Wikipedia or anywhere. And based, we would had a list fr from the corpus, as I said, getting 10% of the corpus and extracting a few other names that we wouldn't have covered. And as a result of out 76,000 essays that had some capitalization issue, we got a precision of 57 uh, and a recall of 55. Uh, so uh, this is quite high considering the short time we spent and considering we're not using any language processing technique. So there are many advanced language processing techniques that we could use using NLLTK or uh, Scikit-Learn or so many of these cool things that they can try to figure out, is this a noun? Is this an adjective? And even without getting that deep, we managed to spot uh, all these mistakes. And we can plug this anywhere, in any application, in any plugin. So, and, and this can help the poor teacher who has hundreds of essays and writings to, to, to check, can help spotting which are some of the mistakes at least. Uh, this is the precision and recall for capitalization. So, as this is something interesting. So um, I was reading an article that was discussing how efficient it would be for us to try to d identify post-tagging and see what is an article or a noun and so on in a text written by someone who doesn't speak properly a language. Uh, how well would that perform? And it's very interesting that normally these tools perform very, very well for beginners levels, because beginners, they usually make very short phrases, such as phrases of up to seven words, whereas uh, advanced learners, they would make longer phrases, which are more sophisticated and are harder for you to try to spot out these patterns. Um, this is the F-score per nationality for capitalization. So the more advanced the users get, the harder is for our algorithm to check. And for articles, we just used a very simplistic approach. So we would check words uh, that would have A before uh, a vogel, or situations where it would be AN before a consonant. And only this, so it's extremely naive, gave us a uh, a not so good result. This precision is totally misleading because if we don't get anything, the precision is being set as one. So don't trust this 97% of precision. But the, the good thing is, although this is extremely small, 
We wrote this in five Python lines of code. It got already around 7% of the problems with articles. So it's already something. And these are, this data is from another one. It's not from articles. And this is the result, the F score. And this is how well uh, our scripts and heuristics worked for our database. So these are the levels of students, beginner is one, advanced is 15. This is how well we, we successfully found words that were misspelled and so on. And you, you can see here uh, that as the initial graph, beginners tend to make more mistakes than advanced. So here are some of our proposals of next steps. So we plan to clean up the code. Uh, we can use some probabilistic models to improve the spelling checker. Capitalization, we could use post tagging, and we could try to identify what are organizations' names, places' names, people's names, without having to have a hard code list with those. Articles, we could also benefit from post tagging dealing with plurals, so if someone is using an article like A with another word that is in plural, that shouldn't be happening. Um, we are planning to build a very simple user interface where we could allow anyone to paste text and try this out. And we are planning to integrate this to our platform so the teachers can give to the system input and feedback on how all the corrections were done, and we can learn from the teacher's experience. And uh, this would be a slide which hopefully you guys would contribute to adding ideas on how we can tackle this problem. If you know any tools, any, if you have any ideas, um, mm -hmm. you can tell us and we can improve it. And just some quick advertisement. Mm -hmm. So tomorrow, Rodolfo Carvalho, who is be speaking today, he organizing a coding dojo. Who here knows about coding dojo? They are quite fun. They are a way where people program in, like, in a group. So you have people pair programming, others just observing. We discuss problems, and it's amazing. It really helps people to improve the way they code. There is this video, which was done in Brazil. It, it has Portuguese things, but it's quite fun. You can see how is the workflow of Dojo. So if you have any questions, you can ask me. You can ask Rodolfo tomorrow from 9 to 12. And that's it. So if you guys have any questions, there is my Twitter, there is the, our team's email. If you would like to know more about the project, to contribute, to complain, criticize, suggestions, anything, anything, any feedback is welcome. Thank you, guys. Great. So uh, we'll switch to the questions. Thank you for asking through Slido. So first one. Uh, do you use any of machine learning algorithms? Not yet. So we did this during the last week, and we didn't get time. We thought to have a good machine learning applied, we would have to train and tweak all parameters. And we just decided to, to do using very, very naive approaches and see how it would work. So we actually spent less than 20 man hours to build this. So, but we do plan to use machine learning. Good. The next one. Have you used the Genism library when an analyzing the text? No, we haven't. But I, I will certainly have a look at it and, and try to, to use it. Thank you. Good. So, uh, a proposal. How about setting up a Kaggle challenge? Sure. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> Anyo anyone would like to help? <laughs> Uh, good. So uh, a more uh, technical one. What what is the WC error? Is it interesting as it grow initially with the language knowledge level? Let me see. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but hopefully the slides will tell us. So is there any WC error? Let's see. They should be here. Word choice. Yes, there should be. We can check if we wanted to check. So we could even get here. Although uh, the word, this one, we, we could classify them as spelling mistakes as well. 
So what I'm doing here is just saying to the analyzer, get the original data and compare to the original data. So we will have total uh, precision and total recall. And I'm asking it to output, so just so you can see a few examples of how the WC looks like. Oh, God. No. It doesn't exist. Wait. Word choice. Yes, guys, for this data set, we don't have them. Let's check the V data. Let's get here. And let's try to see what we have. Yes, we do have here a WC error. Uh, but as you might expect, it's in this horrible XML file. But if you want, we can check it close and understand the WC problems after the talk. It's here. Good. Can we can we go to the next one? Sure. Uh, so uh, why not use existing, uh, for example, LibreOffice spell grammar checker? Um, so we wanted to do something in Python because we like Python. I suppose as you guys are here, you like Python as well. And uh, we just wanted to have something. We didn't want to work with Java. We already have Golang, Python, Ruby, Perl and so many languages in our stack, we didn't want to have any Java concerns. So, and we couldn't find any Python tool which does this. Sorry, there is Python interface to like Is there? Sure. That's awesome, we didn't know. So we will certainly try it. Thank you. Good, so, uh, so um, did you choose Python prior to beginning of this project? Yes, yes, okay. we did. Uh, and how about other subjects like math, physics, learning, music instruments, etc.? Have you thought of this? Oh, that would be super challenging. Uh, we would love to deal with this, but right now we're on our platform is mostly to teach languages. And even in languages, if we wanted to do a similar thing for Slovakian or Portuguese or anything, it would be so hard. So we're just trying to do this one better. We propose to the company, and they will probably be adding this in our next features in the product. Great, so good luck with that. Uh, have you participated in any similar project uh, for your native language? Uh, I did participate back in Brazil. So I worked in a news portal, but, but it was a bit different. I, it involved uh, natural language processing. And the challenge there was um, we had lots of news and we wanted to parse those articles and extract the key concepts from the article. And we wanted to understand people who used our news portal, which kind of content and which kind of concepts they were interested in. And we would recommend to them articles based on that s those similar concepts. So it would involve some language processing, but not mistake related. It would be a little different. Thank you. And the last question uh, we're going to ask, uh, do you use teacher supervised algorithm training? Not yet, but that's certainly one of our next steps. So as we have lots of teachers using the app, we can collect their feedback and we can make our, our algorithm to learn from their feedback. So yes. That's the next step. 